My name is Ronald Andrew Lockley II. I'm from, originally from Elizabeth, New Jersey. My mother, her original name was Bernice Faison. My father was Ronald Andrew Lockley I. My father grew up in Elizabeth, born and raised. My mother, on the other hand, grew up in a part of, a, of Jersey which at one time was called Potter's Crossing, which now is South Plainfield. Um, I would say I have a very, very humble beginning because my father was in the military during Vietnam. My mom, a lot of people don't know this, my mom used to be a background singer for Duke Ellington. My mom's first husband, which was Duke Ellington's first drummer, which was Sam Woodyard. So I have a unique dynamic when it came to the household, when it came to music. My mom had five boys, but I'm one of them. And as of right now, there's only three of us left. Um, my younger brother died in 2003 of a massive heart attack. My older brother died in 1999 of uh, lymph node cancer. Um, Ten days actually before his 40th birthday. Um, my experiences as far as life itself is very a unique journey for me. Um, my parents instilled in me a, a, a discipline like any parent would do. Um, they would show you what's right, what's wrong, and then like my mom and my dad, they'd let you bump your heads or you figure it out yourself because as kids, you know when your parents tell you something, they, you pretty much don't want to listen to you unless you heard your friend talk about it and then you listen. But then no, my mom was a real hardcore firm believer of tough love because she had a number of boys. You know, my older three brothers, their father wasn't there as much, so my mom had to raise there by herself. So she was a mother and father, and plus, when it came to discipline, my mom didn't believe in leather. She didn't believe in switches. My mom believed in her hands, and my mom used to box because my uncles, you know. So when my mom, it makes me sound like my mom was a terrible person, but no, my mom had to deal with the demographic of the time and age because my mom had to raise men and not raise boys. So growing up from the 50s all the way through the 60s and the 70s, you know, the age of Aquarius, if you want to call it, and you would know what I mean when I say that, but it was in the air. It was just something there that how you raise people. You, you had the civil rights movement and everything like that. Um, but they get to the nitty gritty of who I am as a person. It's, I'm like, I guess I'm like a stone in a sense. If you go to the forest and you pick up a stone, sometimes you have ridges, sometimes you're flat, sometimes you feel nice. I'm multifaceted in a sense. Um, I'm unique in my own little way. I would say I'm, I'm Renaissance Man 2.0 because as a man in this day and age, you have to take some of your old with the new. Um, a lot of times I, I think about my grandmother a lot because she taught me more of how to do certain things than my mom did because my mom always worked. During the week, my mom was a, a teacher on the weekend, my mom was a bartender, made extra money for us. My father worked for Exxon for 27 years. You know, my, well, my, I didn't have a bad childhood. I actually had a real great childhood because I've been to places that have kids that are my age now and never still haven't been. I have friends and family who are afraid of planes. I've been all over the world twice before the age of 30. So I've experienced things that a lot of people don't experience that I have. Um, Being here today, I think it's my responsibility. And the reason why I say that is because my story is unique, but it's not like everybody else's story. A lot of it was a lot of uh, stupidity on my part because growing up I was, I was spoiled to an extent, but I wasn't. But I was a little naive too. Um, but I knew enough about myself to accept and not accept certain things. But I still made bad decisions, but that's what kids do anyway. Um, I left high school, a year before I left high school, f fell in love with a girl. I was a nerd, 3.7 GPA. I went from 3.7 to 1.6. So my senior year, I looked good athletically, but book smart wise, I just, just messed up in the head because I became part of the uh, narrative, meaning 
I let some girl take me away from my true responsibility, just trying to educate myself on a better level plane so I can become a more productive human being in the society that I lived in there until now. Um, it was a hard task to get to where I'm at now. Yeah, I still make mistakes, but I know I'm making them, so that's why it's fun, but anyway. Um, right out of high school, I went to a junior college, and while I was there, I was so mad at myself that I burnt myself up because I was there on like pretty much, I was a track and field dude. I, at one time, all I wanted to do was go to the Olympics. I was nice when it came to track and field. I'm, I knew my stuff to a point where I was ignorant about it. Like I was arrogant about it to a point where I was that dude at the starting line. I clown with you, make joke, but I was like, when it got said, I'll see you at the finish line and know you're not gonna win. That's how confident I was, and I was that bad. You know, when I got to college, it was almost like that, but it was the fact that I didn't allow myself to push myself more, even though I had intentional fortitude. It was just the fact that I wanted more, and it was more the fact that it wasn't the athleticism that I had, or it wasn't the athletics of the school that I was at. It was more or less that. I disappointed myself and I took it out on myself to a point where I allowed myself to go to this school when I wanted to go to Syracuse University. And yeah, so instead of allowing it to just to blossom and stay in school, I, I just, I, my first semester I passed, I had like a 3-2, but I left school and joined the military because I wanted to stop being naive, I wanted to stop wearing my heart on my sleeve which in a lot of ways the military made it worse. Not as far as being naive, but it just made it worse in a sense. But like I stated earlier, you have to bump your head to realize the mistakes you make so you can become a better person. And then eventually when you get older, you become a better father. Um, I joined the military and I pretty much went to Desert Storm. Uh, my first duty station was Kaiserslautern, in Germany. I stayed on, um, the concern, uh, Kaiserslautern concern, and it was like the best time of my life because young black man in Germany, and, and the motto was darker the berry, sweeter the juice, meaning all light-skinned women, white women, they loved us. I didn't have to do anything. They'd come up to you and talk to you, and I've, I've always been a people person, but at first I used to be real shy, and that's why I said it made it worse because I like to talk too much now, but it is what it is. I'm, I'm better for it, so. Um, but then again, the other side of me being, you know, hot-headed and impetuous, it got me in trouble, so I left the military after like three years. And then, like people always say, you have to find your niche in life. So when I got out, I just tried to explore different avenues of things. And I started working at UPS. I was a supervisor there and stayed there for pretty much like 10 years. Um, now, just to go back a little bit, there are little things where I would say that a lot of times I never really dealt with certain things, but I saw it. Like, growing up, I never heard somebody call me the N-word, and I kind of make fun of it because I was like, you mean necrophilia or notoron? I just changed the dynamic of the word, but you know what I'm talking about. All right, so. And, but I would watch it happen to people and I used to question why did that happen. Where I'm from in Elizabeth, you have different sects of towns, whatever, you have Peterstown, um, you have uh, Elmore section, you have downtown, uptown, you got Midtown, you know what I'm saying? Every, you got relocated Bayway, you got Bayway. Um, and then you got the, uh, certain parts of downtown, which is like the pier, pretty much. Uh, Elmore section was all the Hasidic Jews, Jewish people, people who so-called had super money, whatever. Um, Bayway, Elmo, um, Bayway, Elmore, uh, let's see. Bayway, you, you had people who were like working class. Midtown, you was either in between, you was, you was middle class or lower class or you was middle class or upper class. And, and Midtown was, a, it, it, it was in all three areas. So if you live in the poor neighborhood, you could still be in Midtown. Or if you was middle class, you still live in Midtown. Or you was, if you was upper class, you still live in Midtown. But it was like, and my, my folks were pretty much, I grew up on both sides, I would say, because at a time when we lived in this apartment, 
and um, my, my, my godfather and my godmother were our, our landlords, and they, we lived above them, and like kids, like we gonna be kids, we make noises, and I can remember them with the booms, doing all little enough, you know, tell shut up, you know, stuff like that. Um, but it was humbling because back then it was a family, you know, you did certain things and you enjoyed it. Um, I was always the scrawny one out of all the brothers. Even when my little brother was born, he was born like nine pounds, four hours. When I was born, I was born five pounds, eight ounces. My daughter was born five pounds, six ounces. So I guess she'd take after her dad, but I'm just saying. Anyway, um, uh, and when I said earlier, when I say I saw racism, I saw it in a way where when I, I'd be driving or I'm on my bike and I'd see people getting messed with or cops, how they treated people. And when they saw me, they left me alone because one of two things. One, that cop knew my father, or that cop knew my mother, or them cops knew my brothers. So it was like I had, I felt like Robert De Niro in, in Bronx Tale. I had two different fathers. I had my father and then the fake father, and then the fake father did make sure you take care of what your real father teaches you. It was like that to an extent. But I didn't have two different fathers. I just had like, this little protective thing. And it's not like I was sheltered because, like I said, I saw everything, but it, I guess just being a kid, if it don't deal with me, I'm not gonna deal with it because I don't understand it. Um, as I got older and I started realizing who I was as a person and who I was as a black man, I started engaging in conversations with my older brother. My older brother's name Gregory Woodyard. He used to work at George Mason University. And uh, my brother Gregory graduated from Tuskegee, Alabama. And if you know anything about Tuskegee, the one thing about Tuskegee, they're engineers and they're super intelligent, arrogant men. My brother was arrogant, but when he said he knew something, nine out of 10 times he was right. So conversations in my house when it came to my, like all of us went to school, we all had our specialties. My brother Greg was an engineer. My brother Michael was like, he could have worked in a think tank because he was a mathematician. My brother Darrell, um, he was more like, uh, I would say an engineer too, but he was more like a social engineer, real smart. My baby brother, he was an accountant major. Me. I was like the accumulation of all of them. When I went to school, I had a double major. It was culinary arts and economics. Exactly. So the culinary arts side of it is I was learning how to cook, and I was taking hotel and restaurant management and management courses, where the other side, I'm doing statistics and accounting and ethics, and I'm like, oh. But I was a nerd like that. So it didn't bother me, but it bothered me because one side of me didn't want to just stick in the books. I want to be like athletes, so let me pass through. and then, but as I got to understand that knowledge is power and I had to stick to my guns. Okay, um, when I would talk about my father in a sense, my dad was a very unique man in the sense that even though he had older two brothers, his older brothers were older than him. Like his older brother was like 30 years older than him and his other older brother was like 25 years older than him. So it's pretty much when he grew up, he was an only child in a sense. Um, my father used to sit there and tell me stories about when he was in Vietnam and he was in the Navy, but my father, if you saw him, my father was a light-skinned black man, but when you see him, you swoop him down, he was Sicilian Italian. So all my father's friends growing up were Italian. And it's like, he never dealt with racism, but when they found out that he was black, all his friends like, man, we still love you the same, just don't tell nobody you're black, leave it alone, let it go. Because once you open your mouth and say something, some things may happen or whatever. Um, with that, like I said, my father lived a relatively, he was a hard worker. Right? I base a lot of my fundamental perspectives in life off my father, even though growing up, me and him didn't get along, because he wanted me to do it his way, and I told him I had to do it my way, because I can't do it your way. You lived your life, I have to live my own. So, I remember him telling me a story that the worst time of his life was when he was in the Navy, because he saw racism for the first time, really, hardcore. And it was hard for him to understand it. 
because even though they, I look like you, but you're going to treat me like this, I'm a human just like you, but you're going to treat me like this. So my father became this quiet person. And you know what they say about quiet people? That's the silent killer. Like, my father was very quiet, but don't mess with him. That's just how he was. But he was a hard worker. He had instilled in him, work hard and take care of your family. Um, and a lot of them stories I would take with me when I joined the military, but like I said, I got right out after a certain amount of time when I first went in. I didn't really see racism when, even when I got back out of the military, but then there were times when I would hear people say certain things, and it was quite uh, funny to me because, uh, like even today's society, I, I think it's funny that when you don't use a word, you tend to forget what it is. But when you continue to use a word, they try to reinvent it or try to say something else. But then if you look at the word Negro, it's Spanish for black. If you go in the dictionary, if I'm, I'm not quoting this right, I might be, I might not. But if you go in the dictionary about 20, 25 years ago, that word meant beautiful in a sense. But now when you add the ER, all of a sudden, you're trying to dehumanize me by using the word. But if you're intellectually inclined, you're smart enough and understand that we were the people who created the words and gave the words definition. If it doesn't apply to you, why well, get mad at the word? But we do because words are powerful, you know? Like when people say honky, I, this is fun, that's the funniest word in the world to me. But when, I, when people say, what's that word? It's just like the N word, but for white people. I never heard that. That's my point. Okay. I stayed out of the military for 10 years, pretty much. Uh, I worked, like I said, at this one job and UPS, and, and I, you know, pretty much stayed out of trouble, whatever. But I still had that itch about the military because my father used to tell me all the time, you need to finish stuff. You need to finish stuff. And we as black people, we don't do that a lot. We start, but we don't finish. So I took it upon myself to like, I gotta finish this. And plus it was that I was at a point in my life where when I went back, my whole premise was to go back and be a drill sergeant just like a full metal jacket. That's what I want, because to me that's a drill sergeant. Even though I use a marine drill sergeant, but that's a drill sergeant. You'll take a, you'll take a piece of flesh and you mold it a certain way. But before you mold it, depending on how the flesh is, you gotta flatten it so you do what you gotta do to get rid of all the bumps. And that's what this drill sergeant did in this movie if you watched it. But that's what drill sergeants did back in the days. They took everything civilian out of you and reprogrammed you to be, I shouldn't say this, a killing machine, but you became a functional military weapon of circumstance. And that's the better way of saying it. Um, so I, I got back into the military, and my first duty station coming back in was Fort Hood. <laughs> I had a lot of, I had more good times than bad times, but I had some of the worst times in the military ever when I was at Fort Hood. When it comes to racism in Fort Hood, you got civilian racism, but then you got military racism. And in the military, if you knew anything about Fort Hood, they had this thing called the good old boys. And the good old boys was from an E-nothing up to the three-star general. And you can always tell by the way they acted and the certain things they would say if you were paying attention. But for the most part, he would treat you the same. But when it comes to certain things, you weren't allowed to get it done for you or people like you. And I'm saying it like this. If you wasn't cool with the right people, you wasn't getting promoted, period. I got to Fort Hood, and when I came back into the military, I was 35 years old when I went back in. And all my life, even when I stopped running track, I've always been a guru going to the gym and staying in shape because I was like, if I take my shirt off, I want some woman to look at me. So they go, damn. And then look at the husband, how come you can't look? That was me, I just stupid, this is me. But I stayed in shape. I was still com trying to compete and run and stuff like that, so I was in great shape when I came back in the military. So it was like, I got to Fort Hood and the first thing I did when I got there, I got to my unit and it was, uh, it was pretty much with the first calf. And as soon as I got there, six months later, no, no, exactly, I got there May 27th, 2007, when I, went, when I got back in. 
exactly 19 days later, I was in Balad, Iraq. My unit that I was with was Bravo Bulldogs, first calf. They was already out there for 12 months. I got, I was a late deployer, so I stayed out there exactly eight months. They were there, so basically when we all finished, they were there for two years. I was there for 18 months, I mean eight months. And I got to see a whole other side of the world in a perspective because I was an infantry soldier. This time around, when I first went into the military, I was signal because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And signal was easy for me. And even though I was a cook, I mean, like I was a chef or becoming one, I should have did that when I first came, but no, I wanted to try to do something different, which to me it was a bad idea when I think about it in hindsight, but when I came back in, I went infantry. I wanted to be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. So I get out there and I get my first experience of what war is and I handle myself accordingly. Now, there were people who had some type of grudge against me because I was older and they expected me to think that um, you're supposed to respect me. And I was like, it's just the number. What are you talking? And there were people who just didn't like me. You know what I'm saying? And personally, I didn't care. I didn't give a damn. Because my hot-headedness, I still had that. Plus, when I first got into the military, and even prior to that, I took martial arts. When I was over in Germany, I got my, bl my black belt in a year and a half, and one style in another year and a half, I got another black belt. So I have a black belt in Shotokan, I have a black belt in Taekwondo, and I have a black belt in Kempo. And I did that all. And one of them I did outside, then inside, and then the other two I did in Germany, and I continued it when I got back out. So I've had this mentality because when I was in high school, I used to get my ass beat. Like, I'm about to get raw now. I used to get my ass, and I was scared to fight. There's people now who haven't seen me in 30 years, they think I'm still that dude, and the first thing I say to them, like, I'm a very peaceful person, but if you disrespect me in a way I feel threatened, I will end you. Not meaning that I will kill you, I will do something to you to the point where you're gonna remember and never ever touch nobody like that. And I've stayed like this for a long time. And through my martial arts has helped me calm down because I have a little form of PTSD and I know how to deal with it. So it's just just certain things. So when I got back in and I would do certain things, it's like I tried to calm myself down when I was downrange the first time with my unit. You know, they had to get used to me. And I had to get used to them. And for the most part, my first aunt at the time told me, I like you. PFC Locker, because you take it for what it is. You are a soldier, you don't care, you do what you're supposed to do. And I was like, yeah, I'm not here to try, I'm not, I'm here to make friends if I can, but I'm here to do my job. And I know respect is earned and not given. And I had to earn respect of my peers. Even though I was older and you're supposed to respect your elders, no, I had to earn their respect because they've been in the game a little bit longer than me in this type of situation. But then when we came back, a lot of people left that I was cool with, that I was learning the craft, as I would call it. And like I said, if you know anything about infantry, and it's, it's a rewarding MOS, but a lot of people look at infantry soldiers as rocks, like we're stupid, but you have to realize we have the highest scores of getting in the military, and we're some of the most ingenious people and the smartest people. Why? Because it's the fact that we enjoy the thrill you have to be a little narcissistic to become an infantry soldier, to me personally. You have to have a, a sense of uh, je ne sais quoi, in a sense. You, you are, you, you, it was a movie that Denzel Washington made, all right, and he was somewhat like a, a bodyguard. And the other actor in the movie pretty much said, he's about to do his masterpiece, and that's what infantry soldiers are. We are creators of a masterpiece. If you let us do our job the right way, we can fix and become the resolve. But in society, in the last 30 years, we've been made to change our methods and tactics when the rest of the world do the same thing that they've been doing for years. All of a sudden, we've had to do certain things a different way because we have to be more compassionate of people, which to me, I don't understand. But who am I to judge? I, whatever. So then, my experience at Fort Hood, so when we get back from Balad, this was in 07, there's a whole new group of people coming in, and it was a certain individual, and I'm not gonna say his name because I'm not giving him power, but eventually me and him became real good friends because he respected me because of what I did and what I allowed myself to do and how I learned. 
this individual came from Ranger Bat, and if you know anything about the military, you have a different sex of infantry where you have, you have Delta Force, you have Special Forces, which is our Green Beret, and you have Rangers. As an infantry soldier, our Bible is the Ranger Handbook. And there's one particular person I'll talk about became my squad leader, but he came from Ranger Bat, and he straight up was, he was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, but I already knew he was a racist, and I knew it. Just by the way he made comments and said certain things, you know what I mean, how he thought he was better than some people of color. Now, like I told you, when I came back in, I was 35 and I was in great shape. And then when you're downrange, if you're not on patrols or going out in sector, your other job is to clean your weapons, make sure your craft is great by learning your job and anything extra, maintain your zero on your weapon, and going to the gym. I went to the gym all day, every day. And I got my weight up to a point where in 07, I had 5% body fat. I was like in the once almost the best shape of my life to an extent, and I was doing my thing. We got back from that, and we're back in what they call um, you're in a wartime situation. Then you come back, and you're not doing nothing, so you 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 just at your company. Any other MOS, they got the stuff to do every day, from like medics to uh, 88 Mike, which are truck drivers. Uh, uh, you have mechanics. They have something to do every day. They can maintain. It, training every day it becomes monotonous because anything you do in life, it's perishable information. You may be a statistician or you may be an economist, but if you don't do the key things, you'll forget how to do it and you'll be mad at yourself. And that's perishable. So when we don't train, that's why we try to let it to the point where it almost go away and then we, boom, blast you. And then all of a sudden, you you remember it better the second time around because you're reinventing the wheel again and it stays with you longer. So when you're back and you're in garrison, pretty much, that's what we call it when you're not doing it, all you do for the first six months back is like calm down, get reacclimated to the city life, blah, 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 and all this great stuff. And all you did for six months is play sports. Play sports, play sports. So you can get, yeah, so when you get a bunch of new people, they want to get to know who their soldiers are. So this certain E6 that I told you came from Ranger Bat, he thought he was the, he thought he was like the hot shit on toast. Straight up, and he wasn't. And I, I proved it to him twice. We're playing football. And he's like, oh, look at the old man, slow, you slow ass. I just looked at him, I was like, I'm turning my side, like, this man don't even know me. Okay, I looked at the dude, and I was like, throw the ball. I did a simple move, and I ran past him, and I had him by 10 yards. I just put my hand caught one hand, caught touchdown, turned around, threw the ball at him, and I ran back, didn't say nothing to him. Oh, you disrespected me? I just turned around and looked up and I kept it moving. Cause I was like, you just mad because I did that to you. Oh, you won't do that again? I did it four more times on different plays. And then he started to realize, oh, you, you're somewhat of an athlete, huh? I was like, I'm okay. You know, because I was trying to change who I was. I kind of grew up a little bit more, you know, so I left it alone. And then he's better in basketball that he says than he is in football. Me growing up, I have a lot of family members that either play for N1, all my friends that went to college, they played overseas. So when we get together, we ball. We go to a park, seven o'clock in the morning, we ball like all day. So I was kind of okay, I could play. You know what I'm saying? I could literally play. We got on the court and it was the NCOs against the soldiers and he was sticking me. He didn't score a point and I had 15 on him and 10 assists. Oh, you, you lucky, okay. But this is when I was telling you earlier, the good old boys were coming to effect where, this is when it was like, oh, you think you better than me? And I was like, no, it's not even about to be better than me. You are coming at me in a way that is argumentative and abrasive. I'm an older gentleman which who is trying to keep us cool with a young, Ignorant ass white dude who think you have a superiority complex over people. First of all, you're five foot nine, and I'm almost six one. You're about 165 pounds. I'm every bit of 200 pounds and 5% body fat. Me personally, I can destroy you. You think you can destroy me, but I'm not gonna go there or allow myself to go there. You know what I'm saying? 
I did too, many, too much reading, too much you know, I just left it alone. What I didn't realize is that, like I said with the good old boys, he was part of that little clique. And every time I disrespected him in his eyes or embarrassed him more or less, it was worse on me. I started getting the shit details. I'd be on time early than everybody, but I'm still getting the shit details. Not allowed to do certain things. Getting punished for other people's stuff that had nothing to do with me. When promotion came around, I got passed up for promotion after promotion after promotion. And after a while, you just don't care no more. I started feeling like I didn't like where I was at. It was like, and plus in infantry, you don't really see a lot of black people. So it was like, when you saw the, the, the platoon picture, it'd be a bunch of white people and two specks. And then it'd be bad that he a black dude, but he more white than he black, so he's more like them. And you're sitting there like, dog. But I used to go through that all the time, but I never let it get to me. But then it got to the point when I got passed up to be an E5 twice, and it pissed me off. Now, that certain NCO, he got his six. You know, he was my team leader, he became my squad leader. So then one day he pulled me to the side, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, man, I'll be able to speak freely, Sergeant. And I gave him the business. 45 minutes, I cursed him out in a way that he's gonna remember me. I told him how I felt, and I said, right at this particular time, you want to go outside, we can fix this. I can take this rank off, and now we can fix this real quick. And then after it's all said and done, you're either going to respect me, like me, or you're going to know I'm cool, but you're not going to fuck with me. After I said that, he sat there and he looked at me, and he was like, why you never say anything? Why? Look how you've been treating me. And you know what he told me? I was trying to figure you out. Oh, you have a hell of a way of doing it. I wanted to see, and I was like, don't come at me with the same old bull crap that people talk about, you gotta be better. You white, so how can I have to be better? So don't throw that at me. If it was a black NCO, I would say, okay, I get it. But you, I watched you treat some of your own people like crap, but you're gonna come at me like that? But, 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 special is locked, there's something about you. What is it? Because I'm older and I should act a certain way, which I am, or the fact that I just let stuff go because I'm better than that. Because if I do what I'm thinking, I'm just like everybody else who's ignorant. And I'm better than that. He said, that's what I'm talking about. Look, you can get more accomplished with a conversation than you can do with a bullet. You understand what that means? And he was like, yeah. I just was subtle about how I explained it. War is a situation when two people don't agree with each other. And if you get in my way, I'm going to get you out of my way. That's war in the most simplest form. And I've always tried to be simple. Yeah, I'm a comedian, I'm funny, but I always try to be simple when I'm serious. And right after that, he started liking me and tried to help me do stuff. And I started just doing certain things and like, he saw how good I was when it came to my craft, meaning being infantry. So when I went to the board, all the first sergeants knew me because I was always volunteering myself to help them no matter what I was doing. So when I walked in the book, oh, what's up, Lockley? They didn't say, how you doing special? I just said, what's up, Lockley? Sergeant Major even knew me. Oh, another old dude like me. So it was like that. That's when I realized I wasn't being affected by the good old boys no more. You know what I mean? So that's when the demographic for me changed. Uh, and then my military career was pretty much OK after a while. It's just that it was people that I didn't like. And that's what anything. You're not going to just get along with people. And people are not going to like you, and you shouldn't care, because what are they really doing for you except getting in your way or whatever you're trying to do? So years go by. I went to three deployments, did my thing, whatever. Then after all this time, I've been trying to get to Hawaii. I finally get to Hawaii. And in the cusp of me getting to Hawaii, my mom and dad was finally to the point where all they did for five years straight is, because they were retired, is go on vacation. That's all they ever did, just go on vacation. They was living. Um, I got to hmm, Schofield Barracks, 25th Infantry. And that wasn't even at my unit. I was, I was the Bulldogs in, in Schofield. So, us. I get there, and I was like, I wasn't even, I just was there for 10 days, just got my team, my fire team leader, and I had the best day as far as with my team doing PT, and if you don't know what that is, that's physical training in the morning. 
PT, we went out, and if you know anything about Hawaii, you got to get used to the, the air because it's kind of we're high in the mountain. So we went on this nice ten mile run, and I hate running distance, even I can do it. I just had, but I had fun. So, but that's the thing: when you really have fun doing what you're doing, you don't matter about everything else. And I started enjoying it. I get back, and all of a sudden, I check my phone. My aunt, no, no, my niece and her father, which is my brother, both called me within ten minutes of each other. And I was like, "What's wrong?" All of a sudden, I find out that my dad died. And the way my dad died, it's, it's funny to me. And I say it's funny because he died doing what he loved to do, being around my mom, watching the New York Knicks, laying on the floor like this. He had a massive heart attack watching the Knicks. And my mom was sitting in the chair behind her. Now, you take into consideration my mom no parent wants to outlive their children. And my mom went through that twice with both of her old sons. And then to watch her husband in front of her die like that and she couldn't do nothing about it. Yeah, it was kind of traumatic in a sense. And when I went home and we dealt with the paperwork and everything like that, me and my brothers, which was my brother Greg and my brother Michael, we sat down one day and we all went out to eat. And my mom came home and my mom went and bought a bottle, a Johnny Walker Blue. And we were sitting there drinking. And my mom looked at us, she was like, I love you guys. And I was like, you love me too, Ma. I turned around and went, Ma, we thought you was gonna die first besides Dad, because Dad's always been the health nut. You had, when you had your hysterectomy, you died on the table. When you had your triple bypass, you died three times. When you had meningitis of the brain, it went into your ear, and then all of a sudden, out of 13 people had, you was the only one that lived, that's why your favorite number came. We like, you should have died. And my mom said, you're right. And then I said, but I'll give it six months. You'll be with dad going on a cruise playing bingo. And then my brother started laughing. And my mom said, what you laughing? That's what we're going to be doing anyway when we go to heaven. But it was true. That's what my parents did. They were, to me, they were professional bingo players and going on a cruise all the time. And it was interesting for me because I saw death in so many different ways. But for me to see my mom finally die, it was like, it was unique to me because it was somebody that I actually cared about more so than myself. Did it bother me? Yeah, it bothered me. Because that's your mom, you know, no, that's my, that was your dad. And it bothered me in a sense because it didn't hit me until I walked into the funeral home, the day of the funeral, and when I actually saw him, that's when I broke down. My brother Gregory was like, and now, granted, my brother Gregory is only, my brother Gregory just turned 66 this year, right? My father was exactly maybe, put it to you like this, my mom was 11, nine years older than my father, right? So, despite the fact there was an age, a, a little age difference, my oldest brother called him dad, because he married my mom, his mom. So, it was, it was unique to me to see that because it's like you, you submit out of respect. And I learned that at an earlier, at an older age that you, you're always constantly learning. But like I said, it didn't hit me until I saw my dad die, like sitting there laying there and I was just like, hmm. And then I sat in the chair and I don't cry in front of people because I just, I hate it. But I came down with one tear and my brother was like, you crying? He, and then he said, why are you crying? Then he started crying. Then my other brother started crying. Then my best friend started So you had like 10 grown ass, big ass dudes sitting there going. <sighs> now granted, my father knew everybody because growing up, if he wasn't a football coach, he was at every basketball game, every track meet, baseball game. We didn't play baseball, he was there. So there was close to like 300 people in and out at the funeral. Our procession going to the cemetery to bury my dad was like 150 cars, easy. His friends from when he was a kid showed up and they came up to me like, I remember you look, they, my nickname was either, some people if they knew me or my mom, he used to call me Boo Boo. Cause my mom had a fascination with Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. Or I was little Ronnie and my dad was big Ronnie. All my father's friends that I knew that were old Italian dudes, Hey, little Ronnie, they would see me. You need anything? And they knew I loved Italian food, so when they would do, come to the house, I was, like I said, that's why I never dealt with racism in my town, because I was always around certain people that always protected me. 
But they sat there and had a long conversation with me, telling me that's gonna be all right. He raised you right, yeah, he was there. So I was cool with that. Everything was good, you know, the funeral went great. And I sat there and I just realized what was really going on. And my mom said, go back. Cause I could have stayed another whole two weeks if I wanted to. You know, I got free vacation. I ain't got to train no soldiers. I'm, I got money in my pocket. I can go, you know what I mean? And I had just got divorced my first marriage. So I was like, hmm. <laughs> then all of a sudden there were people who haven't seen me in 30 years. Oh, he wasn't like that in high school. And I, and I didn't stand them. I was like, you talking to me now, but you ain't talking to me then. So I kept to myself, but I went back home. And when I did that, I mean Hawaii, I stayed out there for until about 2015. Right after I got back, I was dating somebody. And it just within like a month, it just went like I was floating. Then that month turned into eight months, and then we got married. Right? But in the process of before I got married, like I said and like I predicted, my mom died six months to the day my dad died. Then all the funny stuff started coming out. My father, I knew this, but I didn't know he was doing it legitimately. My father used to play with stocks all the time. He taught me how to do the, uh, the, the product of 72 and everything like that. And you know, at one time I wanted to get my Series 6 and my Series 29 to be a broker and all that. You know what I'm saying? Because I'd rather be where the money at. Now, I thought, you know, but my father had a serious portfolio which consisted of blue chips. And when my, when my dad died and, and then come to find out, my dad left my mom $1.8 million and I didn't even know until my mom told us. And then that was part of the insurance there. I'm sitting there going, hmm. So when my mom died, in the process of her taking the money out, my mom blew through in six months $300,000 just going on vacation by herself. And I was sitting there like, what the hell is you doing? How'd you do that? And then I thought to myself, I know how I would have did that because I'm a clothes junkie. So I was like, yeah, I know how I would have did that. But my mom, only thing she do is she don't drink like that no more unless she with us. She was in her 80s. You, what? You, bingo or cruise? You ain't trying to talk to no men because you've, you've been with my dad since 67, married a year before I was born, which was 70. And the thing was, that year that my dad died, which was 2012, that would have been their 45th wedding anniversary. And they were coming to see me in Hawaii because they switched their cruise from the Caribbean, which we own property in Puerto Rico. They was taking the cruise out to Hawaii to come see me. And then everything changed, like I said, but it happened. So then when I found out that me and my brother was going to get some money, then to my, that's when I, I started saying, I'm glad I'm getting my money the old-fashioned way. I'm like, what do you mean? White people say it all the time. They get their money the old-fashioned way. Family gave it to them. That's the old-fashioned way. I didn't have to steal or whatever. So yeah, it was cool. So when all that happened, this is when I dealt with racism again. But it was like I was a soldier, but it was on a civilian perspective because I was off-duty. And I went out with my wife, and we went to the mall or whatever. Um, you go down to Honolulu and everything, and they have like what they call an expensive mall. And ever since I was a kid, I've always been in the Louis Vuitton, and that's just me. Like I said, I'm a clothes junkie, so, and I'm a sneakerhead. So I remember this day specifically because I had just bought a brand new pair of 11s. They were all white. I had a, a brand new pair of uh, tapered sweatpants, had on a, a wife beater with a white t-shirt over it. And if you know, if you're real old school, you put that crease down the center when you iron it, had a crease down the center. I had just bought me a brand new Belova watch, all right? I remember this because I had one carat earring, diamond earrings in my ears, and I walked to the Louis Vuitton store. Now, her name was Miss Davis, and she was Korean. Her name was Miss Davis now. I walked in now, granted what I told you, I had on sweatpants, a pair of drawers, and a t-shirt, diamond earrings, and a, a blinged out watch. And my wife had on this a jumper, and she had this bag that I got her when I was in Talil, Iraq, which was made out of raw, actually camel skin. And she had that bag. And she said, Ron, and my wife is a country girl. She wasn't in the bags, none of that. You buy her something, she gonna use it every day out of love and respect for what you do. That's how she was. And that's why I married her, because I always said I wanted to be a country girl or a girl from the islands. I was tired of American girls because they didn't appreciate being with a black man, to me. 
And the reason I say that is because they would always complain about like weird stuff that wasn't relevant to a relationship. Oh, you're not making just as money as me? What is this money thing? If I was making more money, you'd be complaining, which nine out of 10 times I made more money, but I wasn't taking care of nobody like that no more. If you're not equally yoked to me, I'm not messing with you, and I got that from my grandmother. So we're in a Louis Vuitton store, and Miss Davis, she's looking at us, and it's 35, 40 minutes, and she's been staring at us like we're crap, or we're dirt, or how you got the nerve to be in my store. So then I turn around and look at my wife, and I've been peeping this whole scenario out for the last 45 minutes. So I turn around my wife, <clears throat> and there were four bags in there that the cheapest one was seven grand. I told my wife, I like, picked that bag, that bag, that bag, and that bag. Now, granted, the cheapest one was seven grand. The bag that was this little bag, and it was like alligator skin, it was $32,000. And this is a bag. I wasn't going to buy it, but I was trying to prove a point. All right? And my wife said, what you doing? And then my wife said, Ron, don't be no ass. We in a store, I don't want to get locked. I was like, no, I'm going to prove a point. As soon as she grabbed that first bag, all of a sudden, Miss Davis, oh, how can I, can I help you? And then I was like, hmm. I said, hmm, real loud. I was like, hmm. Now, there's another dude, his name was Jeremy, who worked there too, and he was, like, he was sitting there paying attention, whatever. He was behind the counter. He, and then he spoke, how you doing, sir? I was like, I'm good. Um, so you gonna buy something? I said, I'm gonna buy several things, but I'm, I'm working on something right now. And I said it to him, just like that. So my wife started looking at that bag, and then looked at the other bag, and we had my on the display table, and sitting there like this. So the bag my wife picked was not needing another one of them four bags. It was a bag that cost $3,900 that she wanted. So I bought that bag. And just before I bought the bag, I was like, Miss Davis, I think you need to walk away from me and my wife right now. She's like, what are you talking about? You sat there for 45 minutes and looked at us like we was a piece of trash. You thought we wouldn't have no money to pay for anything in here. And the only reason why you really paid attention to me is because, and I did this on purpose, I went to the bank that day and took out $12,000 in cash because I was gonna pay for something. And I've always been a cash person. I just don't like checks, or that. that was just me. I've always been a cash person. I took that money out purposely and laid it by my wallet and all this stuff. And when she saw that, then she wanted to pay attention to me. But then she made an assumption. Either I was a drug dealer, she's like, oh, so uh, what do you do for a living? I was like, why is that important right now? I'm here because I'm here. Do you play a sport? And then I really stood up like, for real? You need to walk away from me right now. What are you talking about? Like I said, you made two assumptions. You First of all, what do I do for a living? So you assume that I'm a drug dealer. Because you see this, all because I bought a diamond out Beluva, and I got one, one carat each, diamond earrings, right? I had this on, which is three, almost three carats. My wife, her ring is super big. She got the same watch I had, but for females. Now, oh, now you want to pay attention because I brought this money out. Okay, I'm going to let Jeremy get this money from me as far as get what he's supposed to get. Because the only thing you're looking at is how much money you're going to make after you make this sale. So you need to walk away. Because until you realize what you did, I'm not talking to you no more. So when I left that store, I spent $12,000. I bought me a pair of brown Louis Vuitton shoes. I bought me a brown belt to match the shoes. My wife bought me a wallet. I bought her that bag. I spent, and then I went outside and was like, and I started laughing to myself. And then my wife said, I want another bag. So in all, she bought two bags. I bought my stuff. I spent $12,000, boom. He got his commission. But then before I left, around November, Louis Vuitton has a shoe, which is called, it's anaconda skin. And it's like a pale gray. And I said, I'm not going to buy the shoes or I can't get the belt. So they didn't have the belt. You know, and if you're in a Louis Vuitton store, you give them your information, they, you get their phone number and your email. So this will basically happen. I left the store, and I said to the lady, you have a wonderful day now. And I hope you remember this lesson that I taught you. And my wife's like, shut up, but no. But like I said, you, you made assumptions, you came at me wrong, and now you're reaping the benefits of being ignorant. You know what I'm saying? This is another time when I control myself and I try to use more of this than use this. About 20 minutes later, I get a phone call. Mr. Elijah, Jeremy, we can get you that belt tomorrow if you want to. We can have it shipped in from such and such in the States. I was like, no, I'm good. And right after that time, 
that one particular, every time I walk in that store, when Miss Davis saw me, how you doing, Mr. Lockley? Is there anything you need? Are you thirsty? We just got brand new Moet in. Would you like a glass? Every time I walk in the store. Right after I did that, that same day, I went to buy my wife a truck because I said I wanted to buy her something like seriously big. And my wife wanted a truck, so I said, oh, I got you a truck. So I went out and bought my wife a Candy Apple Red Porsche Cayenne S. And then that same day, we're driving and everybody's looking at us like, and it was funny to me because this is what happened. Every seven days, you get a group of new people from all over the world to come to Hawaii. We're in this parking garage, right? And we parked the car and we're walking away. But then I was like, baby, I left something. So I run back and this British couple walking by, like I said, I'm still dressed the way I was dressed. So I start tapping on my window, like looking this out like this. This dude brings out his phone and start going like this. And I turned around, I was like, no, you didn't. I said, baby, give me, them, give me that favorite beat. She said, boop, boop. I was like, next time you think somebody's stealing something, check yourself. Then he said this, look at the Negro with a Porsche. Twice, in one day, I dealt with that. And my wife said, you're good today. I was like, yeah, because why react in the way they think I am? I'm being stereotypical. First of all, when you look at black people in a whole, when we do certain things, we do certain things because everybody else do it. A lot of black people don't buy Porsches, but I always like Porsche, because like I said, I was always different. And if I could have got what I wanted, I was gonna try to get that Lamborghini truck, but it was too expensive. But I'm just saying, most black people buy Cadillac, Escalade, Yukon, Tahoe, Range Rover, BMW, Mercedes-Benz. That's what you see us buy on the norm. And I don't want to be stereotyped. So I try to be different. And if me being different, I have to do stuff like that, I'll do it because you gotta look at us for like everybody else. I'm just a person who has melanin in his skin that gives me a slight different color to my skin and make me look different than you because at the end of the day, your blood type is the same as mine. And like I said, I learned from my mistakes, but do I like it? No. Racism at that time, like racism now, is a travesty to American society. Because if you go back generations, we've been demonized because of the color. We've been taught to fight ourselves so much that we do it on a regular basis. You can go on Facebook and we always fighting each other and somebody will show it. But you've never seen no other race of people, maybe white people, but never seen no other race of people showing themselves fighting on a, a media like that. We do stuff to each other because out of just ignorance and hate. I remember going home from school when I, before I actually left school, they wasn't proud that I was in school, but they was, the dudes were talking how happy they were because they did a bid. How they did, went to jail, and I was like, oh, that didn't make sense to me. And all my family members who did illegal stuff, they knew I was an athlete and I was smart. I may have wanted to do that because it's easy money, but they kept me away from that. But I knew what it was so I could stay away from that. My family members like that, they used to congratulate me, and when they congratulate, they used to take me out. Food, buy clothes, and that's why I became a clothes junkie, because if I got certain grades when I was in high school, if I beat somebody at a track meet, my cousin like, let's go to the mall. So I used to equate greatness with that, so yeah, I mean, it was a good thing, but I never liked racism because you hating me because you don't know me. Think about it. If I really look at what society is, we have different forms of racism now, from football players, basketball players, sports, certain type of things that we do. We're institutionally still slaves, or as I would call it, slaves to the rhythm. But we don't look at it that way. You know, if you're allowed to become the top of the top of the top of the echelon as far as sports, because they will say they allowed that to happen, but no, I know about a 200 LeBron James. I knew about 100 Michael Jordans. But they were just in the right place. Them two were at the right place at the right time. And in life, it's called premeditated karma. Straight up, it's premeditated karma. If you live a certain way, or you work hard to try to get something, it's gonna happen for you because you preordained it to happen. Even when I think about religion and church, we, we demonize ourselves, and, and it's a form of racism in a sense because of the fact that how when you have these mega churches 
or you see these little things I've been reading on Facebook where this lady in her congregation sent the lady in her congregation a letter saying, since you didn't pay your tithe, this is how much you owe since you've been gone. Who does that? And the Bible says you pay 10% of your earnings if you can. Don't quote me, but you pay what you can. You don't have to give nothing if you don't want to. But we have people who take the opportunities of a religion, and I say that because what I mean by opportunity, you're saving a soul. So that's an opportunity to have your soul saved. And you're using it to make a profit off of it. You got to dress a certain way. You got No, Jesus said, you come as you are. Yes, we have to go to a meeting place, but you come as you are so we can talk about the Bible because you may not have an understanding that I do. Like I said, I, my story, as you can see, is very unique because I've dealt with racism in a way. On one side of it, I... <laughs> It wasn't too good for me, but on the other side, I try to deal with it appropriately. Now, my mouth gets me in trouble. You really piss me, I'm gonna let you have it. And I dare you to do something about it. You know, but again, I was raised a certain way. When I hear kids talk about, I got a gun, I'm like, that's nice, but how fast are you gonna be able to pull that gun before somebody can rip your throat out? Why are you talking about crap? No, I'm speaking facts. You do all this talking, what you gonna do to a person? The people that talk a lot, those are the ones that get their ass beat quick. The ones that's real quiet, they walking away from the situation with no scars in their face, and that dude lay there because he got knocked out. Females act a certain way when it comes to certain things. You know, they're so used to people taking care of them because they look a certain way. That's a form of racism in a sense, too. Because if you living a lifestyle that you're here as a female, but you want a male that has a lifestyle up here, what makes you think this dude wants you down there? Seriously, what do you have to bring to the table? And it may sound ignorant for me to say that, but this is what this life is presenting itself. When a man meets a woman, you become one because it's like this, and I say this in a joking way. When you date a person with option to buy, meaning you are dating and figuring it out until you get that point, you ask the question, and when you buy her, that means you got that piece of paper saying y'all married. And it's the truth. You hear people talk, oh, it's a 50-50. No, it isn't, it's 100 and 100. I'm saying all this to the fact that we forgot how to live as people, to me. We forgot to look at how life really is. You can look at it in a perspective by saying this. You have some theologians say that Adam was right next to Eve when the devil spoke to her and convinced her to eat from the tree of life. And he stood right there. Me, I said I'm a comedian in a sense because I try to look at the funny part of it. This is when a woman knew that she was susceptible to slick talk. And he knew that this is when we start saying this, when we're okay. And what did he do? Baby, try this apple. Okay. And right after that, the tree of knowledge hit him, just like the matrix when he stuck the thing in the back of his head and all that information came quick. And right at the particular point, what happened? Ooh, we're naked. Now, take that same perspective and look at life as it is. If they would have never ate from the tree, that's just like saying this. If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around, does it still make a sound? Because nobody's there? So if he didn't eat from the tree, and he didn't eat from the tree, will we be in the garden eating butt-ass naked? You, I mean, some people might look at it like that's disrespectful, but that's reality. The reality of me telling my story is the fact that I will bring humor to the fact that it is inhumane to act a certain way towards a group of people, case in point. If you were all white, and I asked you a question, if cops messed with you every day, and, and, and bothered you every day, and punched you and hit you, do you think that's right? Do you deserve that type of treatment? No, then why do we, not us, white people allow black people to be subjugated to the bullshit? Because y'all don't give a fuck about what happens to nobody else except yourselves. Think about it, Nat Turner. When he did what he did, he was just doing what he did because all the white people was doing it from years prior to him. They made him read the Bible and the part of the Bible where it says, and this is what they took out of the uh, Bible when it came to marriage, is what? Obey. So he read everything that said obey. So they gave you religion. They made you forget about your real religion. But you had to obey because this book, which is a religious thing of God, to obey them, your oppressor, your boss, your beater, your cager. 
But then he had an epiphany and he began to what? Read the Bible. And when he did, he did the same thing to them that they did to him. But when Nat Turner was killed, not only did they kill him, they destroyed the fiber of his soul, meaning that they crushed his bones to dust and they burnt his skin where it was no more. So you do not exist. They've been like that for years, and we're just now realizing, look, when people say they don't understand why we still worrying or giving a fuck about 420-something years, we only been free for fucking 50 years. Let's really break this down. We only been free for 50 years. The 13th, the 14th, the 15th, and the 19th Amendment is for us. Emancipation was for us, but then when he died, they want to go backwards because they don't give a fuck. And there's no matter how smart we are, they still try to dehumanize us and bring us back down to this fact that we're a, a, a piece of phlegm, a smegma of nothing. But then you want to look like us, you want to get lips like us, you want to get tits and ass like us, you want to have bi babies by us so you can have these perfect babies. If you watch TV, you never see an all-black couple no more. You never see an all-white couple. You see mixed couples. Or when you see millennials, they show these dumbass commercials, which is another form of propaganda and racism to me. All of a sudden, a young lady's sitting there with a halter top and her boy shorts, and she's on her phone, and the dude is interviewing her. Oh, I see, you, uh, I see you're good with computers. Do you know how to use this? Yeah, I know how to use Facebook and Instagram. But you're condoning this by making fun of it, but when it's really reality, because this is how our kids are looking at life right now, because they don't know how to have a conversation. You will sit in a room with eight kids, and you won't hear a word, but they're talking to you because they're going like this. Then you got other commercials where, yeah, she's dressed appropriately. I want three weeks vacation. And I'm the head of human resources about to hire. No, you're going to get with everybody else. So I'm going to jump on a mystical creature, which is a unicorn, and jump through a window. You're going to give me three weeks, and I'm going to give you what you want? No, fuck you. You're perpetuating a stigma that is ignorance to a point where we don't realize it because we look at it on TV and it's a form of propaganda that we're not understanding it, but we think it's funny when it's more damaging than helpful. Let's take in this perspective. It took a cartoon to turn into a movie from a character to bring together 375 million African-American people to dress a certain way because of why? Black Panther. But where in the hell was them 375 million black people at the voting poll? So you tell me that's more impactful, which is a fictional character, that's more empowering than you doing your civil duty to try to put in the office the person that best represents you and your point of view and values? And you wonder why, in, in hindsight, why we where are we at? Ignorance is bliss. Bottom line, you don't look at life for what it is. You look at life for what it's going to do to you. We've been psychologically trained to act a certain way because we don't know no better. And when you try to fix the narrative, what happens? You get this intellectual person who's so black that he forget that he's black, but then he acts more white than he is black. And he tells you in a way that you don't understand that you need to do this when you should have keep on doing the hell you were doing in the first place. They told us to forget where we come from. They told us to forget our religion. They told us to forget our culture. And you wonder why we did certain things in the woods and made certain sounds. You wonder why we sang spirituals. You wonder why we do this and that. We were systematically picked because of what we are capable of doing. You've hated us from the door. You're trying to systematically destroy us now. From the Tuskegee Airmen to how in certain parts of the United States, they were telling these little young ladies, oh, this is vaccination when they're making when black women sterile. I can go along the line and keep on mentioning stuff, but I can mention them, but people ain't gonna care because they don't give a fuck. And it's sad to say that, but it's true. And it might take me to say the way I'm saying it or people to understand this, but I hope whoever sees this, and I apologize, but you gotta hear it this way. Because if I stay really intellectual and be like, yes, yeah, you're gonna be like, oh, he's just talking. No, I'm angry and I'm tired of being angry. I didn't wanna tell my story until the one lady said, you need to say something. And I was like, all right. And I hope that after I finish, you're going to look at me totally different after this. Because like I said, I call myself just like Martin Luther King. I'm an intelligent hoodlum.
Reason being, because I'm in the hood trying to fight my way to, to, to seek that knowledge, to get that knowledge, and if I gotta do it, I'ma steal that knowledge, because I know knowledge is power. Look, I'm a 46-year-old freshman at Wiley College, and I have the highest GPA, and I'm getting an award for it. But you got people complaining at me who are younger than me, who has a way better, stronger, and easier uh, brain capacity. Why you act a certain way? Yeah, I'm a clown, but for real, this is business. This is, you need to take this as, this is part of who you are. We've had black colleges because they wouldn't let us go to white colleges because they couldn't stand it, because they knew the possibilities of what we can do. Everything that was created in America from Jack Daniels to the Ford Motor Company to video game when it first came out to the light to the cell phone was done by numero uno. They just took the credit. Think about it. in history, white people have stolen everything. Everybody swept and down. Bill Gates, Bill Gates stole that stuff from the dude from Apple. Let's really break this down. And Jobs knew about it, but what did he do? Just like they always do. Ain't got nothing to do with me. Serious? The opioid problem. Back in 85 when Ronald Reagan brought crack, nobody gave a damn. But now that opioids are in the white neighborhoods of rich people, oh, you can't. Look, it affects me because I have to take sleeping medicine at night. So I have to only, I'm only allowed to get 18 a pop until they functionally look at the fact that I'm not trying to sell whatever. I have sleep apnea, okay? I'm being punished because some dumbass wanna pop a pill? Look, let's keep this real. If it's from the earth like Bob Marley said, it shouldn't hurt you. Marijuana help you more than anything, but they still classify it as a class one drug with barbiturates and all the other stuff, but you worrying about opioids because it's affecting who? You. No matter how we even look at it, they're always trying to push their agenda. They say they want to help us, but they're not. I mean, I just don't get it sometimes. You try to play by the narrative and do what they say. You think you're going to get ahead, and the only thing you do, you're going backwards. You're just moonwalking right now. It's a shame, but again, I'm tired of being mad. I mean, Barack Obama made me cry because in my lifetime, I never thought I would see a black president. I thought I was gonna see a gay or a female president before I saw a black president. And then you have people like Cornel West who said, Barack didn't do nothing for us. Sir, he's one man I respect highly, him and uh, Dick Gregor, I had mad respect for him because Dick Gregor kept it real. He was, bit, he was a little to the left, but he kept it real. But the thing about Cornel West, when he made his statement about Barack Obama, all I kept on saying to myself is when you have the, the Senate and the Congress and they tell you from the door, I don't care if that monkey's president, I'm not helping him and agreeing to nothing he gonna do. So what makes you think he gonna be able to do anything for any of us or anybody? But he did things and revolutionized the presidency that it made it fun. He had a whole genre of people who said, I can do that. You're supposed to be inspirational, not demoralizing. You're supposed to be courageous, not disgusting. You're supposed to be beautiful, not anorexic. A religious leader who was white said, Miss Obama with her arms out is blasphemy because as a president's wife, you're not supposed to have. First of all, of all, the president's wife didn't have no guns the way she did. She was toned. She looked good doing that. Let's see Barbara Bush do that. Hmm? Uncle Ben's his wife. I'm just saying. But when Donald Trump's wife, butt naked, oh, that's a form of beauty that you can't explain. I want to say it, but I'm not going to say it because it, it goes against what I'm saying. But you go like this, for real? For real. I can see her pelvic bone. Shut up. Choke yourself. I'm just saying, you know? No matter how you look at it, they got always something to say negative. And I don't get it. When Barack Obama wanted to do things as far as race relations, he wants to talk to a terrorist. Trump do it first time in America's history. I was like, y'all need to stop. Like I said, if it's not the commercials, they're trying to tell you how to eat. They're trying to tell you how to live. You should look a certain way. 
You know, you, you got people who are so against violence that they don't even teach their kids how to defend themselves. And you got little kids killing themselves on Facebook. And you know what I'm saying? Because the parents didn't want to teach the child how to defend themselves. All I can do is this, and then become part of the solution instead of the problem. You know, and I know it's gonna take work. I wish I would have been more like this when I was younger, but never too late. I just think that at the end of the day, if you look at life in a perspective, and you try to live how God wants you to live, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna commit a sin here and there. As long as you know your God is a jealous God and you ask forgiveness and you're sincere, you should always be good. Just make sure when you do certain things, you're not caught up in the nonsense of doing something that's really detrimental to the existence of your existence. Like I said, I just don't like the fact that I go to a HBCU and sometimes, sometimes, they're 50 cents short of a quarter to me because they don't want to learn the history behind why we do certain things. They don't want to learn the history about the history to help them be where they're at right now. If you don't know about Wiley College, it's the school about the great debaters. And, and, and this is why I love the school so much because Melvin Tolson and in his infinite wisdom was an arrogant bastard, in my opinion. Why? Because he didn't like certain things and he didn't want to get killed by being ignorant. So why not take your intellect to destroy your soul? intellectually, let's create the great debaters. Let's go against the narrative and do something that you don't think we can do. But when we do it and we surpass what your white counterparts do, then you start, huh? And it's always been like that. And I don't get it. Look, get over it. All I ever wanted to do is, I want one, one white person to apologize. And the gentleman who louses this equipment to use, I went to a seminar with him before I came here. And I told him the story about how me and my brother used to have conversations. And um, I used to say the same thing I just told you. I just want one white person to, I'm sorry for what my forefathers did, and be sincere about it. He did that for me. And I'm grateful. And I, I know it's just one, but it's a start. But we have too many people who just, if you ain't right, you ain't right. Movies are a reflection of what we do. When, when Black Panther came out, you hear these dumbass comments, oh, all black cast. Y'all been doing all white cast for years. Now y'all complaining? And then I said something that people, kids didn't get it, but the older crowd did. I said, what was the name of that movie with Mamie in it? Uh, Gone, remember Gone with the Wind? Who was the best actress in the movie? The Help. She made the movie, but Clark Gable got the uh, Oscar. And he ain't do nothing. Sidney Poitier in 1960 for a movie, he got best actor. Then, but before him, we got nominated in 49. But then after that, Denzel should have won it for John Q, didn't get it. He should have won it for Malcolm X, didn't get it. He should have won it for Hurricane, but didn't get it. But you had to put us in a demoralizing situation when you were a crooked black cop. Oh, now we gonna get the award? Holly Berry had to play a trick who let a white dude who hated black people, but he loved black women, to get an award for that. And the only one who didn't get it because it was stupid to me, because they should have gave it to him, was Will Smith for Ali. He should have got it for that, but Jamie Foxx took up the mantle and he got it for Ray. Why is it that when we do impactful things and you reward us, it's like you're trying to pat us on the back? And I say that because no matter what we do, we can be the ones on the space shuttle, we can create this, whatever, but you're still going to figure out some way to try to make, you still a nigga. You still a nigga. I don't get it. Seriously, I don't. I mean, this. And I go back to what I said like about 20 minutes ago. I'm tired of being tired. I am. I'm tired of being tired because at the end of the day, I'm just a man trying to get ahead. And I know education is going to help me. Yes, I served my time in the military and I enjoyed that. 
yeah, I had to do some things I didn't like. There's things in life I don't like, but I know I have to do them. But again, I am tired of being tired. You know, and is there anything else you would ask me? I'll tell you if I have a perspective about it, but a character of a man is based on his experiences, how he takes an experience to better himself, to be a better man. Despite the fact that you could be rich, be well off, be found favorable in anything in life that you do and everything can fall into place, but if you do not take that experience and learn from that experience, you're still gonna be that fool. You're still gonna be that fool even though everything going in your place because you ain't learning shit. We all know people older than me who still act like they 12, women and men. But they run the world though, that's the bad thing about it. Like I said, I'm proud to be a black man, and I'm proud to be married to a black woman. You know what I mean? I'm proud, I'm ultimately proud to go to a school where a man set a tone to teach us how to be better individuals through education. Okay. What I'm tired of is that I'm tired of the malarkey, I'm tired of the tomfoolery, I'm tired of the ignorant shit. Because you talk a good game, but you still do the same stuff that kept us down there in the first place when if you just paid attention what's going on around you, instead of going around it, the quickest way to any situation is a straight line. If you just be straight about it, be honest with it, acknowledge. I'm not saying it'd be better, but you would be a better person. Because, like I said, they still haven't figured it out. You know? You don't like when certain things are done to you but you are the, the, you are the narrative, so you implement rules and regulations to make sure that you and your kind are well taken care of. But the other ones who's trying to reach a hierarchy of intelligence and economic prowess, you put in obstacles and watch us run around like we're ants when somebody pour water in their ant hill. But you don't like that when somebody do it to you. Like I said, Ignorance is bliss. If you see two fools arguing on the corner and you don't know which one to fool, who the fool? I mean, that's pretty much all I got to say, but I hope that this is helpful. I hope I enlightened you. I know I probably said some things to a point where you felt where I was coming from, but I had to do it that way because it makes sense. The most profound thing I ever heard in life came from a movie called Forrest Gump. And it may sound cliche, but it's profound to me because it's real. Stupid is that stupid does. some of the frustration and sentiments, I just felt like I was like, it was just, I was watching it as it's kind of But that's what's going on in life right now. Yeah. Females are not being paid fairly. We have more female black and CEOs than black CEOs. We can go to football. Highest paid football coach is my man from Alabama. He made 18 million a year. Take a coach who's technically better than him at an HBCU. He's only getting paid 250000 What's the difference? Oh, let me tell you what the difference is. The alumni who would take the opportunity to pay to make sure the school is in a certain type of demographic. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. If you, if you, if you ain't white, you ain't right. Because at the end of the day, and I'll say it just like this, when we know Roe versus Wade or any type of situation when it comes to like inequality for black people, if we were treated like the 1% when we were, came over here instead of as a slave, we wouldn't care about what they're doing because if we were part of the 1%, we'd go get it our damn selves. We wouldn't have to ask, oh, you need to change the, uh, the curriculum so we can be just as smart. You no, know, pick up a book and read more. Oh, yeah, that book may be old, but the old books tell you shit that the new books don't. 
because they change uh, words and they leave stuff out. Older books make you learn harder and better. It's just, I don't, like I said, back in the days, it was in the air to how to be a person, particularly a black person. Nowadays, it's all about who get hurt. It's just like what Mob Deep said, my man from Mob Deep. You know, it's who get first. I'm a little dude, but if I get you first, I want to fight. And it's the truth. It's just, like, like I, if I had the money to do what I really wanted to do, I'd go and leave America because I'm really just kind of disappointed right now. After all we went through, I think about two things, and one of them are funny. I think about when I watch Boondocks and if Martin Luther King was still alive, what he would think about today. But to me, if Martin Luther King would have listened to Malcolm when he was telling him, you need to stop this stuff and actually think about what you're doing. Because a lot of people don't know that when he gave his speech three years later, he retracted everything he said because at the time it was good, but look what's happened, it's gotten worse. But you shot a man in cold blood because you were afraid what he was about to do. And then you had another man who showed you a form of black on black crime who were killed by his own people. And how did it start? Get your hands out of my pocket. Just the same dude when he was a child, I want to be a lawyer when he told the teacher. And the teacher said, no, your kind should be janitors or something like that. Like I said, it, it's funny. I could have went in a whole other direction by talking about how When you're white and you do something, you'll get two years. But when you're black and you do the same thing, you get 15 years. And I always bring, I always think about that swimmer dude, that ass from Stanford. You raped an unconscious girl behind a dumpster. You're not disgusting, you're immoral. You're a piece of shit to me. He didn't, he got six months and he didn't even do three. But you had the audacity and the scruples to go to court and try to say, oh, you know why I went to the jail in the first place? Reason being because his family is part of the 1%. Now, as an individual at a black college somewhere up north, yes, he raped a girl, but he got 17 years. Because he was black. Serious? Like this kid the other day, Florida. Oh, we, we felt as though he had some type of mental problem. Dog, let it have been Raheem. Not only they wouldn't have put no bulletproof vest on him, they would have probably treated him just the way that dude shot the nine people in the church in North Carolina. Are you hungry? You want to go to Burger King? But he's about to get the death penalty. He's going to die. I'm surprised he didn't get killed in jail. But you still trying to figure out why that old scruffy looking white dude going through Vegas in a hotel with a crate and a trolley full of guns, you didn't question his ass. And you shot over what, 200 people? But then, let it have been me. I wouldn't have survived. They would have found a reason to shoot me and justifiably come up with some bullshit ass saying that, well he tried it, no bro. If I'm not white, I am not right. And then it's sad to, for me to keep on saying that, but it's the truth. And I respect the white people that are here and helping us, but I'm afraid for them because they're going to start really seeing the real truth and they're going to find out the atrocities that their people had done and they might kill themselves because they're going to feel the pain and, be, and feel all the shoulders of the people that, you know what I'm saying? Kids nowadays, because they're taking the history out of the history books, that the White House was built twice. Not once, but twice. Why do you think Asian people don't like white people? Because what they did to them on the West Coast when they was building the railroad over there. And all the messed up rules over there they had about them. Look, they made rules for us. Yeah, we was free. The pig law, this law. Just, uh, yeah, and then what did they do? Oh, we found a new way to get, to get free labor. Ooh, we can rent out the prisoners to states and cities to do work for us for free. 
there's a um, there is a, uh, a documentary TV show, uh, no, not a do documentary called Slavery by Another Name. If you ever get a chance, and if it's still up, whoever watches this, watch that. His name is Mitchell, Slavery by Another Name. The last name of the person who uh, wrote the book and helped with the movie, his last name is Mitchell. This guy was born in rural part of Mississippi as a white guy. And it took a white guy to write a story about how the atrocities of how we were treated. I don't have a problem with that, but if you've ever noticed, white people make the great slave movies. White people always tell the great stories about us. And I'm not saying they're not conscious enough to realize what they did, not them per se, but, but they'll be the first one to tell us, well, you should get over it. It's only 423 years, but the Holocaust was seven, but they got paid. Only thing we ever wanted was 40 acres in the mule. You don't even want to do that. Every other nationality of people that's been in America got paid. And the ones that got paid the most is the ones that got fucked over the most. It's the Indians. Have you ever seen a real Indian? Technically, you're looking at one because my mom was half Apache and half Cherokee. And my dad was half Cherokee. But when you think about Indians, Indians were black. They weren't red. They were black. So that's why I consider myself black. OK? Remember when he asked that question and you heard me say, are you talking about when before the earth was spread apart, when all the continents together? Because I was going to talk about how they walked, the Mongs walked from all the way over there to America during the Ice Age. He said, no, 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 the people, I was like, oh, okay, now just sit back. I love history. I love history for what it teaches me, what it helps me understand. If you don't understand and know your past, how are you going to deal with the present and how are you going to try to deal with your future? Like I said, I can go in so many different ways about racism, but somebody else can probably tell the rest of the story. But all I'm saying is this. A character of a man, no matter what color you are, is based on the experiences. And this is something that I came up myself. A character of a man is based on the experiences, how he can take those experiences and better himself to be a better man. And despite the fact that you could be Everything fall in the place, you could be rich and everything will just be favorable for you. But if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're going to be still that same ignorant kid, even though you're 50, because you ain't learned nothing. People look up to men because of the characteristics we instill in people. You don't see, you don't see fathers really talking to their sons no more. And I'm talking about black fathers, because systematically, when it comes to certain things, they conditionally got us out of the household. In the last 40 years, you've seen more single parent households, and a lot of times because they don't know any other way. When it came to welfare, you can't have a man in the house to get welfare. But then if you think about what welfare was started, I think welfare was started by Eisenhower, if I'm not mistaken. But I could be wrong, but I think it was started by one of the presidents to help his fellow white people just like the projects was started by one of them to help white people. The projects was supposed to be an in-between place until you find your real place you want to stay at. But you see where projects have gone to. I grew up in the project. I stayed with my grandmother in the project. And you learn stuff when you're in a project. You know what I'm saying? You get to sit on them horses, move the, you get the, the monkey bar. You know, there's a dynamic behind it. And I got family members on my father's side of the family, eight generations of being on welfare. Because they say, why I got to work when I can get this easy money? But then they want to get mad because they want to change the rule by saying, you need to try to get a job and get drug tested. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you want to do that, just make sure you don't do nothing before you go get tested. But I'm just saying, but it's just the fact that these are things created to help them, but we are the personification of them. And Trump is trying to get rid of welfare and send food, which is not even good for some of the people. What if <clears throat> you had some type of door, you can't eat certain things, but you're going to send me stuff that have all the things I can't eat. What then? You're trying to get rid of after school programs. It's like a new form of genocide, in a sense, when you think about it. He's trying to systematically destroy everything that helped people, such as some of them congressmen and senators, to get to go to school like they did. 
but these are the same fools talking about, we should get rid of this. Nah, bump the scholarships. Nah. And Miss DeVos, she's a rocket scientist. She, she need her ass beat because she's stupid. You took your own state, Michigan, and turned it into a project, and they have the worst school systems in the whole United States. Curriculum. Equality. Common decency. Ignorance. Awareness. And consciousness. I mean, I just don't get it. I, 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 I'm just tired of being tired, and um, that's all I really have to say. Based on what you've said today, are you still, in light of maybe your faith background or not, your experiences or not, still hopeful? And if you are, how so or why not? Okay. I was born and raised African Methodist Episcopal. And if you know anything about that, if you know anything about Masonic or Matry, the first African Methodist Episcopal preacher was Prince Hall. Um, that was my grandmother's church, and it taught me a lot of things. It's pretty much Baptist, but it's more construct to me. My faith is even stronger now because there have been times when my life now and my life in the military where if it wasn't for faith of somebody praying for me, I would have been dead a long time ago. Um, and in even today's society, how I think, I think that's the one thing that's being lost and it's been lost. Because once they took prayer out of schools, look where we're at. This country was founded on, in God we trust. But we ain't no God we trust. This is how much money I can get. Well, if you ain't white, you ain't right. Um, I think that as a unit of people who have different opinions, different background, different uh, sexual orientations. We all have a God that we serve. You can be atheist and believe in a higher being. You could be Hindu, Buddhist, but at the end of the day, everybody's trying to meet Shangri-La and wait for Jesus to come back, or you see your God. If they were at least trying to do that, this would be a little better place, because if you are a religious person, you still try to treat people the way that you would like to be treated and show compassion and empathy. Um, I just think that the lack thereof of people who, are, who lost their faith or their spirituality, they really need to dig deep and look inside and think about, if you don't have no faith and you don't have no religion, then how do you get by in a day? What is it that helps you to want to get up the next morning? What is it that helps you try to be a better person or a good person, period? What is it that you try to be a great parent to your child? Beside the love for your child, but sometimes you need a little bit of faith because you're gonna have that hard head kid because you're not trying to treat them the way you were treated because you want them not to go through what you went through, but at the same time, if you did treat them the way you were treated, there would be a little more have humility, and they will understand that through hard work and understanding that I can get anything I want in life. And as far as, what's the last question? Uh, it was just, in light of all this, are you hopeful? Okay. Or is, has it affected any of that? No, I'm more hopeful, but I'm just tired of being tired. When my professor talked to me about this, it was a conversation that him and I had, and, and it was because of my, his predecessor, in a sense, because my history professor, Mr. Fogg, he used to check me in history class all the time, but him and I used to go at it. But it was intellectually. How come we're not talking about this, but at the same time, didn't this happen? Well, Mr. Lockley, yes, this did happen, but we're not. But you have to talk about that, but that equates to going there. Well, yeah, but 
are we doing this because of the lack thereof of intelligent process in this room, or are you just doing it because it's part of your curriculum? And then I stay after class, what the hell are you doing? I'm trying to ask a question to try to make these people in this class conscious enough to realize that history is more important than, no offense, statistics. No offense than your girlfriend and boyfriend. More offense, your existence in this world today because you're black. And then when I said it, he's like, oh, he got it, but you need to stop being interrupted. I was like, all right, got it. And the more and more I got into history class with him, is more and more I was like, yes, I get it. He made me understand, because my teacher who I'm talking about, he lived, he had a sixth grade education, Mr. Fogg. Like, put it to you like this, the program we're doing right now, next year, y'all know we gotta do it in our schools. I'm doing it on him. Because at one time, he was the most, he was the deadliest man in the world because he learned a martial arts that a lot of people didn't know, and he was black. He met everybody, knew everybody. A lot of people don't know him, but his other name is Sifu Fogg. But that's a whole nother story. But once I actually said that my minor was history, he introduced me to Dr. Ahmed, which is my history teacher now. And when Dr. Ahmed actually had me in class, he said, Mr. Lockley, elaborate. When I broke something down to the point where he's like, oh, you need to come with me to this program. I need a mind like yours. Yes, you talk too much sometimes, but I need a mind like yours because you know how to ask a question that's gonna annoy somebody, but they're gonna be happy that you asked that question. That's why I'm here, because I know I can be of some help. And like I said, I wasn't gonna do this part until somebody really asked me, but I was a videographer when this one lady did this Spanish female. And when she started talking about how Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, or whatever, they have a caste system, just like in Hinduism, you know? But the caste system with them is the fact that the darker you are, they can somewhat predict how successful you are, you're gonna be as a person. So the darker you are, the less successful. The lighter you are, you're more like white, so you'll be more right. Just like I've been saying. And, but the fact is that her father was a retired colonel. And he was dark skinned. But he was so old school that he was so, the best way to say it is that when certain people said certain things to him, he had to act accordingly. Because he felt as though if he would have reacted irrationally, it would have jeopardized what he all worked for. Her story was like this, she, and, and she told a story about how she felt as though it stayed with her because her father and her never talked about it no more. She was 12 years old, and she was a real cute, young, beautiful Spanish girl walking around this store, which was like, I think Costco or Sam's Club, and this white man was just following her. And she noticed that. So when she walked to her father, this white man walked up to her, oh, your daughter is so beautiful now. She's 12 years old. Oh, your daughter's so beautiful. I remember me and my friends used to go to the islands and meet these little young girls and have our way with them. First of all, who the fuck are you telling me some bullshit about you used to go to islands and fool around with 12 year old girls, but you're telling me because my daughter reminds you of some girl you did that to, and you're telling me about my daughter? I would've went to jail there because I would've gave him a two piece and let him know that don't you ever say that to nobody. Just because you think you white, you can say anything you want to say to somebody. Because if it was your daughter, you'd try to have me killed. And I told her that after she said that. She's like, yeah, but my father, he's like, okay, yeah, yeah. But when they got to the car, he told her to stand outside, right? And he got in the car and he screamed and he, ah, and he's banging. Because he felt as though if he would've did something irrational, it would've took away everything he did. Seriously? Then there was another situation where they were doing their yard and some white guy stops his truck and walking because they was putting a house up, a little, little storage bin in the backyard. He stops. Oh, this is nice. I don't know what they're paying you, but if you come work for me and do the same thing, I'll give you a nice lunch and fresh uh, a lemonade. He didn't think the fact that that house belonged to them. He didn't think that. But he just assumed, and this is in Colleen, Texas. Right after that, he didn't, um, he didn't do his lawn no more. He paid somebody to do it. I understood her pain because when growing up, when my parents were taking me to Puerto Rico, my mom had friends who were dark skinned out Puerto Rican. And I saw it happen to them, but like I said, I didn't get it, I didn't understand it. But I saw it. I had Dominican friends where, the father, he knew I was cool, but being I was a little darker, he used to like, 
he had his assumptions about me, but when he found out who I was as a person, he respected me and I was cool. I was allowed in his house. You're Spanish people, which came from Africa, and you have a caste system because you got light skin and dark skin, but you're Spanish. But you feel as though the whiter you are, the better you are. See, that's systematic. That's, that's an inherently taught genetic malfunction because if you're dark, you're wrong. And like I said, I relate to a lot of stuff because I saw stuff, but it didn't happen to me until I went to certain places. I remember when somebody called me the N-word for the first time. I didn't know how to respond. He got beat up, though, but I didn't know how to respond. I was a kid, though, but I'm just saying. But And then I remember when I was a little bit older and somebody said it, and the first one that came out of my mouth was this. That's all you got to say? Okay. And the dude got madder because I didn't respond the way he thought I was supposed to respond. Because he's around his people. Oh, I was like, and I walked away and went about my business. And then when he saw what I was doing and whatever, he gave me that look like, how you doing that? How can you afford that? Just like when I bought my wife that truck. I can't tell you how many other times when we were driving and we get to look like, or the conversation was, how did you do that? What did you mean? And me, I'm an ass, like I told you. What happened was I, I went to this dealership and uh, I sat and talked to the people over there. They give out loans and I schmoozed with them for like good 20, 30 minutes. And I got the, the deal that I wanted and I bought the truck like you would do. Did you do it any different? Well, uh, you're trying to be funny. No, you're being an ass because you think you're ignorant and you're stupid. And you act like nobody can't do nothing that you're doing. So you want me to say what I'm saying and act the way I'm acting because you think this is who I am. But being that I did it that way, it pissed you off. So why don't you just check yourself and walk away? But I'm saying, they're so used to doing what they want to do, saying what they want to say. And Trump got them saying, oh, you're not even da, da, da. Yeah, remember this. This ain't the civil rights movement back then. We hit back and we hit hard. We're smarter now. I'm going to hit you where it hurt. Take your money. It's called defamation of character. You sue me, I sue you. That's why I say that I'm an intelligent hoodlum. Because I'm not gonna be that other person unless you threaten the livelihood of my surroundings or my bubble, meaning my family. Then I'm gonna act accordingly. But besides that, I'm gonna act like you do. I'll see you in court. And my, my suit gonna be better than yours when we go to court too. You know what I'm saying? So, am I hopeful? Yes, I'm very hopeful. It's just the fact that I think God put this man in this position to show us that the fact that you're not doing what I want you to do, this is what could really happen to you. And it's a weird thing to say, but God allows things to happen to us to, excuse me, <clears throat> to teach us a lesson, just like when God and the devil made that bet about Job. Think about it. He had everything, seven sons, all the money and the land and everything. And the devil said, oh, I bet you I can get him to talk bad about you. Bet, $100. And what did he go through? Leprosy, all his friends tried when he was on the mountain. God is not the God. Think, look what he's doing to you. I believe in my God. His own wife try to get him to talk back. And he had a moment of indiscretion where he's like, no, nope, God been good to me. And what happened? He had another seven sons. He had double the amount of everything, and he got remarried. So think about it. Yeah, I'm hopeful. I just hope I get to see the, the reality before I die. And that's all I'm worried about. You know what I'm saying? It's individuals like yourself who, where you were from, and saw things in certain ways that made you go, why are they doing that? I'm like that too, but why'd they do that? You know what I'm saying? Because at the same time, the only difference between you and me is this, and no disrespect to you, is yours might be bigger than mine, you got different blood type, and I got melanin in my skin. That's the only difference, period. But they don't look at that. They feel threatened because of the possibility of what if? And you still got to look at the narrative always, no matter how you look at it. If you're not white, you ain't right. 
And then ignorance is bliss. 